10,327,000 citizens lived in Sweden on New Year's Eve 2019. That is a yearly increase of around 1%. During the last two decades, since the turn of the millennium, the population of Sweden has increased from 8.8 .8 to 10.3 million. Many factors are behind this development. A population living longer lives, a tip in the fertility rate cycles, and immigration. In this video, we will cover all those factors and project the future of the Swedish demographics. A newborn girl in Sweden can expect to live 84.7 years. The same number for a boy is 81.3. This is among the highest average lifespans in the world, trailing only a few nations like Japan. The economic and educational opportunities in Sweden allows for most people to live long and healthy lives. Overall, the average lifespan has gone up significantly since 1970, for women from 77 to close to 85, and for men from 72 to over 81. Men have sensed gain on women during the last decades. But there are discrepancies within the population outside gender that is also interesting to look at. Geographically, as a man you could expect to enjoy on average close to two and a half years longer life if you live in the southern region of Halland than if you lived in the northernmost region of Norrbotten. Overall, the more populous regions with greater proximity between city centers have a higher life expectancy. If we go down to county level, economic factors come into play even more and the difference between the rich suburb of Stockholm, Dandryd, and the small, mostly rural county of Munkfors, with a declining population, is close to 8 years for men. For women, the difference is slightly lower. In Sweden, we can see one type of counties enjoying long lifespans, previously mentioned Dandryd, where 83% of the population is born within Sweden. The population live in highly concentrated urban areas with an average income of 53,000 crowns a month, around 70,000 US dollars per year, where the average price of a house is around 11 million crowns, and over 90% of the eligible population votes. On the other side we see two types of areas. First we have the previously mentioned Munkfors, where 84% of the population is born within Sweden. Over 20% live in rural areas where the average income is less than half of that in Dandryd, where an average house costs half a million crowns, and where 85% voted in the last election. But we also have, though often less defined by county borders, suburbs with a higher proportion of the population born outside Sweden, like the suburb to Stockholm of Botkyrka. Here, 43% of the population were born in another nation. The average income is on the same level as Munkfors, the average price of a house is 4 million Swedish crowns, and where a much higher proportion of the population lives in rental housing, and where 78% of the population voted in the last election. Education impacts health. On average, a 30-year-old woman in Sweden could expect to live for another 57 years if they have finished a higher university level education. A woman in the same age that only has a pre-high school level education could expect to live 52 years. The spike in deaths during the coronavirus for a moment put Sweden at the epicenter of the global health debate. But overall, the mortality of a rich nation like Sweden is low from a global perspective. During 2019, 88,000 people died in Sweden. In this visualization, 100 people is represented by one marker. We can divide these markers into age groups. Most deaths occur in the 75 years or older cohorts, 72%. Of these 64,000 people, the non-communicable diseases dominate. Here we note the 22,900 deaths associated with ischemic heart disease and the similar, 
and the 13,700 deaths of a variety of cancer diseases. Together, they account for close to 60% of all deaths in this age cohort. Another 8,900 deaths has Alzheimer's and dementia as the main cause of death. 8% or 4,800 people died from different kinds of diseases to the lungs and respiratory organs. Here we include chronic respiratory diseases, asthma and pneumonia. 2,200 cases of death were counted as accidents. In these age cohorts, the largest share is from falls. In 2,400 cases, the documentation was unsatisfying, or the specific cause of death unclear. Moving on to the smaller age groups, we find 16% of the overall deaths in the 65 to 74 year old cohort. Unlike in the older group, men are overrepresented here. In total, 14,700 deaths were counted. 41% of those were cancer and 24% heart diseases. 7% respiratory diseases and 4%, 600 cases, were counted as accidents. In the 45 to 64 year old cohort, 8.7% of the total deaths occurred, 7,700 cases. The shares are similar here, even if the numbers are smaller. Cancer, once again, stands for over 40% of the deaths, and heart disease, just over 20%. Respiratory diseases are down to 4%. Here, accidents start making up a larger share of the deaths, at close to 13%. Suicide now accounts for 5.4%. The younger age groups are even smaller, and just 2,000 deaths were accounted for in the large group of 15 to 44 year olds. Cancer accounts for 20%, while heart disease becomes less likely at just 140 cases, or 6.8% of the deaths in this group. Instead, the broad umbrella of accidents accounts for over half of the deaths here, and suicide within marks more than one in four deaths in this cohort. Violence has the highest share here of deaths in any age groups, still just over 3%. Remaining we have the luckily small groups of 1 to 14 year olds and babies not surviving their first year of life. Here we are talking about so small numbers that dividing it into categories become almost anecdotal, so we will avoid a further breakdown than this. Putting all the age groups together again, we can see that the non-communicable diseases account for a vast majority of the deaths. Cancer accounts for 26%, Alzheimer's and dementia for 11 heart disease 32 respiratory diseases 7% and 5.5% accidents. 1,269 people took their own lives in Sweden last year, 1.4% of all deaths. The same year, 101 people died as a consequence of violence, or 0.1% of all deaths. The share of the media coverage did not match that. Apart from a differing COVID-19 response strategy, Sweden has also been noted globally for its immigration policies during the last decade. Seen by some as a pioneer in refugee relief and open arms towards migrants in need of security and opportunity. Sweden has also been associated with a failed immigration and growing problems with segregation, organized crime and cultural clashes. This video is not about taking sides in that debate, rather to look at the numbers to see in what way immigration has affected Sweden demographically. During 2019, 70% of the population increase can be attributed to a higher number of immigrants than emigrants. The other 30% are associated with a higher birth rate than death rate. The fertility rate of Sweden is at 1.9. This is, while not quite at the 2.1 needed for a population to reproduce, higher than many other highly developed nations in Europe and Asia. The higher levels of today than in, for example, the 1990s can be explained by the circular patterns in fertility rates mentioned earlier, and only to a slight extent to a higher fertility rate among immigrants arriving in the last couple of decades. Even though some of the immigrants to Sweden originate in nations with a higher fertility rate, most studies on the topic show that immigrants conform with the number of children of the destination country only a short time after establishing. Out of the 10.3 million people living in Sweden, just over 2 million were born outside the country, just under 20% of the population. The number of women and men in this group is almost exactly the same. 
This is a clear increase in both absolute numbers since 2000, from just over 1 million, and in share of the population from around 11%. 9.5% of the immigrating population were born in Syria, the by far most common country of origin in the last few years of immigration to Sweden. 7% were born in Iraq, 7% in Finland, close to 5% in Poland and 4% in Iran. Sizable shares are also made up of immigrants from Afghanistan, Somalia, the former Yugoslavia and Bosnia, Turkey, Eritrea and Germany. The big cities host a larger share of the immigrating population, with 25% of the population of the Stockholm metropolitan area, made up by people born outside Sweden. The equivalent number for the whole country, excluding the three largest cities, is just 16%. The numbers vary greatly if you look at county levels. 43% of the population of Botkyrka, as mentioned earlier, were born abroad, while the number for Piteå is just 6.7%. Sweden faces many of the same problems as other high-income nations, falling fertility rates causing a greater dependency on fewer individuals of working age to support a higher number of people in retirement with the rise in healthcare spendings to a great extent associated with an aging population with greater needs of care and support, this can cause economic challenges for a nation. Two solutions are often presented as a cure for this. Either increase immigration from nations with higher fertility rates or somehow increase one's own fertility rate. Being two policies associated with two ends of the political spectrum from a European political map, Sweden has sort of done both. With the large social welfare system, the career compromises families have to make in order to have children have been reduced, meaning that there are affordable childcare facilities available and generous parental leave policies. Working age people are still choosing to have children to a great extent in Sweden today. On top of that, the liberal immigration policies of Sweden that cost 160,000 people to be admitted asylum in 2016 has spent a large influx of young people that could help support the aging population and fill gaps in the workforce. But at the same time, the unemployment rate for foreign-born people is much higher than for the population as a whole. 15% at the end of 2019, in comparison with just 4% for the population born in Sweden. The foreign-born population, as well as children to two foreign-born parents, are also more likely to commit acts of crime, although studies attribute this to socio-economic factors. Sweden is projected to pass 11 million inhabitants by 2029, but this would mean a much lower rate of increase than during the last 20 years. Overall, the political landscape has moved towards reduced immigration, but Sweden still has a large population in or just before childbearing age, meaning that the number of children born is expected to rise slightly during the years to come. It should also be noted that close to 50,000 people emigrate from Sweden every year, most of them foreign-born or children to two foreign-born parents. Today, parties on the right support cutting immigration to Sweden significantly, so the outcome of elections in the coming decades will be determinant to how the demographics of the nation develops. Whether that change will keep Sweden as a role model for some and as a deterrent example for others, or if it falls into a more mainstream path, only time can tell. If I know my country, I would say we'll find one way or another to remain in the spotlight. You can find links to all the sources for this video in the description below. If you would like to support my channel and allow me to put more hours into making videos, you can subscribe and comment down below your thoughts. It helps a lot. And for now, you can check out one of these videos on the screen.